Hello, and welcome again to Homeschooling Helps. I'm Andrea Schwartz. And I'm Nancy Wilk. And if you happen to hear a horn in the background, it really isn't announcing this episode of Homeschooling Help. Nancy just happens to be located near a train stop with a very irregular schedule. So we never know when we're going to hear the train horn, but it's kind of fun to hear it anyway. So that aside, we are starting a 10 week series in terms of God's law and the Ten Commandments. And I'll let Nancy explain why this idea of hers is something we're actually doing. Yeah, thank you, Andre. I really am excited about this series. I grew up in um, in a evangelical church. I say grew up. That's that's where I came to know the Lord. And we didn't hear much about the law of God. We didn't hear much about the um, about the Ten Commandments. And so I kind of had the idea that that was, you know, kind of old stuff. But as I began to read the word and became increasingly convinced through the scripture and as God revealed these things, that law and grace are not opposite of one another. That we can't have Jesus as our our savior and not know that he's Lord and that he is Lord whether he's our savior or not. And so we see that um, the law of God and and grace and the good news of Jesus Christ are inseparable. It's like two sides of the same coin. So where do we put then the Ten Commandments and understand the law of God is the word of God in the righteous and the revelation of his righteous standard. So that's, you know, that's where I want to start with this. And so, you know, just to look at the first commandment. And I'm excited because this gets us down to brass tacks. And if you can't apply the Ten Commandments in your own thinking and in your own home, it will never be able to be applied in the greater culture. So God's word, both in the Old and New Testament, Jesus actually repeats in the New Testament that there are two great commandments. And we can summarize the two great commandments as love God completely with every aspect of your beating of your being and then treat others the way God's word tells you they should be treated. So love your neighbor as yourself. So love God completely and love your neighbor as you love yourself, because the way you're going to love God is to keep his commandments. So we better figure out what God is telling us to do, because if we don't know what he tells us to do, we might accidentally be right a couple of times, but we're more than likely as sinners who are not fully sanctified to get things wrong. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, one thing I want to make a note of, Jesus says that if we love him, we'll keep his commands. So what commands are those? It, it points us back to the Old Testament. And so what we, when we talk about the Ten Commandments, it's not just for the Israel as a nation, but for all of God, but but for all of God's people for all time. And maybe not even just for God's people, but but just exactly the revelation of his righteous standard, whether we are regenerate or unregenerate now, either right. way, right? So when you come right down to it, a couple of things are in play. If God is king, and by God, I'm referring to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God is mm-hmm. king, and mm-hmm. a king has a kingdom. And if we limit the kingdom of God to some time in the past, or just to a group of people who said yes to Jesus, or sometime in the future, we've taken God off the throne because a king has jurisdiction and that jurisdiction is his kingdom. Now we live in a day and age where democracy is much better, quote unquote, than monarchies. And a monarchy is old time and you know kings aren't fashionable or we don't have kings anymore. Well, the truth of the matter is we always have a king. And as you said, whether we bow the knee to that king or not. So God's law and Psalm 138 backs this up. He views his law higher than himself. In other words, God can't lie because his word says that he can't lie. 
And so he basically keeps his promises. So if we disobey God, there's a promise attached to that. It's called cursing. If we obey God, there's a promise attached to that. It's called blessing. So both are operable. You can't escape it. Now, just because man likes to play God, which is something we all have inherited from our first parents, we like to construct narratives that make what we do okay. And unfortunately, the church does it as well. So you'll have people who will say, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. When what they really mean is man does not live by bread alone, but a lot of what proceeds out of the mouth of God and how I'm going to determine whether or not I obey a certain thing is basically how I feel about it. And if I don't fully understand it and I can't fully come to terms with why this is included in God's word, then I don't have to listen to it. So Christians, sometimes even more so than those who say they don't believe in God at all, really devalue God and his word by deciding it's more like a potluck. I, I like these laws because it serves my purposes. I don't really like these. And heck, I don't even understand those, but I don't have to worry about that because I love Jesus and that's enough. You get what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. how can you even start as a person to relate to God if you don't appreciate who God really is? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One thing that um, I understand is that... Um, this is about a covenant relationship between a sovereign creator and his creatures, you know? And so we can't, we can't engage with him outside of the terms that he has established. Yeah, but that's just so undemocratic. Come on. Really? Is that really what you believe? You believe well, that God doesn't answer to us? Oh, come on. I, I paid my premium. I got my life insurance policy. He's there when I need him. Well, I was baptized. I believe in God. So what's wrong with that? You know, I mean, the scripture tells us that demons believe and shudder, you know. So if we say, well, I believe in God, so I'm good, you know, or I got baptized, so I'm good. So how do we know? Or even I'm a good person. You know, and all you have to do is compare yourself to people who you think aren't as good as you. I mean, isn't that the story of when Jesus talks about the Pharisee and the publican? The Pharisee knew that God was lucky to have him. How many people think God is lucky to have us? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this series is going to delve into the 10 broad areas that derive from the two great commandments. So we often refer to the 10 commandments as the two tables of the law. There are 10 commandments, five go on one side, five go on another. And the first table of the law basically tells us how we relate to God in terms of his word. And then the second table talks about how we relate to other people. Mm -hmm. And then there's that fifth commandment, that basically is the bridge between the two, where okay. we get the authority of people over other people, not domination, but authority. So we're going to take one commandment every week and certainly encourage people, please don't end with our summary or our discussion. There's material that Calcedon has, um, a little booklet called Faith and Obedience, which introduces this subject, another book entitled Law and Liberty, a bigger book called The Institutes of Biblical Law, and then, of course, my website that takes The Institutes of Biblical Law and breaks every section down with a lecture, a summary, and a series of questions. And you can find that at the Chalcedon Teacher Training Institute.com or ctti.org. But let's jump into the first commandment. Okay. I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's pretty simple. We all know we don't have any other gods, right? 
Right. I mean, that's like, I don't bow down to, uh, you know, a statue anywhere. I don't, um, you know, make a, a pilgrimage to, uh, you know, anywhere. Uh, we just believe in God. And so. Right. Okay. Is, is but, that the end of it? <laughs> but it's not, of course. Who is God? If God is the supreme being, the sovereign, that means that every thought needs to be captive to the sovereign. So if you have an idea about fashion or you have an idea about education or you have an idea about conflict, if you are not getting your operating basis from God's word, and you're going someplace else, then guess what? You have another God before God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because so when we say when God, we're talking about authority. We're talking about who rules, right? Mm -hmm. So if we just decide, you know, I'm going to go here because this has more information than God's word has, then whatever you go to, that is your God. Mm -hmm. So like Wikipedia or the internet or grandma's, you know, grandma's ideas or, you know, where are some of those, uh, what might be some of those other sources that we would, what we would most commonly go to? Oh, they're countless. Like you said, it could be media. It could be, um, accepted opinion or tradition, but without filtering any idea or concept through the lens of God's word, it's not that we'll always come up with the wrong answer, but it's likely that we will because our starting point determines our conclusions. If I look out the, if I look out the window and I walk outside and I get wet, I could conclude that there's somebody on my roof pouring water on me. But, I, it, but if, if the water is everywhere, well, then maybe we have rain coming out of the sky. But mm -hmm. if I'm convinced that somebody's on my roof pouring water on me, unless I expand my view to see what really is, I can have that wrong conclusion for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when we look in the New Testament and we see that we're supposed to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ, that's not just to think happy thoughts. It's to put our, our thinking and our decisions in terms of God's law, not just whatever happy things we think about Jesus. Right. And it ends up infiltrating our thinking. For example, anybody with young children, are they naughty or are they sinful? Oh, well, yeah. Okay. Sin. Let's identify that if somebody's doing something they're supposed to be doing, we would call that righteousness. If someone's mm -hmm. doing something they're not supposed to be doing, we would call that sinfulness. But, mm -hmm. you know, we don't really want to talk about our three-month-old baby as being sinful. I mean, how can a three-month-old baby be sinful? Well, we obviously have another God before God if we're not going to acknowledge that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about a woman discovers that she's pregnant? We say she's going to have a baby. She's got a baby. She's carrying yeah. it around. But see, if yes. we want to deny the personhood of a baby that's not wanted, then it's not really a baby until she has the baby. She's not really a parent until she delivers, as opposed to, what does God say? Psalm 139. We are all formed in our mother's wombs. So our personhood, our value is there. If we accept any other notion and allow those notions to influence our speech, we're worshiping another God before the living God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So there is no other God higher, no other authority higher and so for us to, to um, attempt to make those decisions for ourselves or for somebody else apart from 
what God has already established is true, then we we are making ourselves a God or um, putting somebody, some someone else above him. Right. So let's take the disobedient child. The okay. fifth commandment says, honor your father and your mother so your days may be long. And later on, we're told in one of Paul's letters that that's the first commandment with a promise, right? So the mm -hmm. promise is long life. Wouldn't it be very good to let children know they're compromising the, their lifespan by being disobedient? Shouldn't right. sin be one of the first things children have communicated to them? Because they'll be aware of it. Because the scripture says that everybody knows God's law. It's imprinted in the fabric of our being. We either receive it because the Holy Spirit dwells within us and we go, yes, that's right. Or we fight it and we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So you can convince yourself that you don't have any other gods until you examine and see where does your authority in every area of your life come from. If it's not coming from scripture and you're not deliberately taking scripture and applying it to your life, my guess is there are other gods there. And as the first commandment, which then really in a sense talks about loving God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, what we're doing is we're giving ourselves a pass when we maybe don't have a pass. See, with God, 70%, 85% isn't good enough. No, it's 100% because we totally belong to him. So let's talk about this in terms of homeschooling when we, and, and why we want to homeschool. or And I say homeschool just because that is the least expensive Christian school I could provide for my children. But we want to educate primarily in terms of God's law, his um, sovereignty over all, and our responsibility in terms of that. What does God say about himself? What does God say about us? What does God say about how we interact with each other? All those things we get from God's word. So a Christian education is very, very important for our children. And, and why we are not fond of the um, public school. I know there was a while that I did, as a single mom, have to um, put my children in um, public school, and that was while I went to work to feed them so we could be um, legal. But it's not where our children are taught that Jesus is Lord and that we belong to him, and how to think in terms of that. So it, you want to talk about that? <laughs> like, well, first of all, like I said at the outset, whether or not as a family you homeschool, send your children to a good Christian school or a not so good Christian school or a public school, whether that public school has a lot of nice Christian teachers or it doesn't have a lot of nice Christian teachers, God's law is operative whether or not you agree to it. So speaking to people in whatever situation they're currently in, mm -hmm. you better examine if there are other gods before God and that you're not making the assessment, well, God understands because I have to feed my children. My guess is now knowing what you know, you might have pursued other ways in which to have your children educated than putting them in public school but maybe your options from your viewpoint were limited. But I think you might advise someone differently now. So regardless of what situation somebody's in, if they endeavor to obey God and keep his commandments and live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, what will happen is they'll recognize, whoa, I'm on the wrong side of what God says. That's the first step. I'm not doing this right, and I need to do it right. right. The next step would be looking for ways in which to be obedient, and that's where the blessings of God come in, because mm -hmm. a little bit of obedience begins the shower of blessing, and there are many people who would help. I know many homeschool families that 
have offered to take other children in until mom can figure out how to do things and then they become part of that family's home school. There are many Christian schools that will offer scholarships to single parents um, in order to help them have a Christian education. But you can't help someone who doesn't recognize the need for help. So if you're in a swimming pool and I know there's a shark at the other end, but you don't know it. And I go in and I pull you out. You might be mad at me because I interrupted your swim. Right. Once I let you know there's a shark at the other end, then your eyes are opened. And now you'll think, well, OK, I got to get out of the pool or I can't go back into that pool or whatever it is. So it's a two way street. People have to want to be on the right basis with God, and then we can help them as opposed to trying to go help people who, quite frankly, couldn't care whether or not you help them or not. Right. And if they don't recognize that that is God's righteous standard, then we, we, we make the assessment ourselves and think that it's not a, that much of a priority to pursue Christian education for our children. Right. Let me give you another example that I have run into recently with young moms because I I appreciate young moms and I like having young moms come to me for advice, not because I know everything, but I do know that it's very easy to get so nearsighted that you put other things above what's important. So potty training. I know people who are trying to potty train children under two. And when those children are not conforming, they're being disobedient and the parent can see the rebellion in that child. And it's like, okay, slow down. If I came to your house and told you I wanted you to pee when I told you to pee, you might not like that. So could we apply the idea of treating others the way we're supposed to treat them according to God's law and recognize that maybe your child isn't being disobedient. Maybe you're applying a standard that isn't have its basis in God's law. And so a lot of parents will say, yes, but I expect my child to be obedient. Well, that's Mm -hmm. lovely. But if you expect your child to be obedient in an area where he or she physically can't do it, or isn't particularly ready, does God tell you to fight that battle? Maybe it would be better to uncover in discussions and interaction with your child, whether or not that child is being stubborn or not. And rather than force that child to sit on the potty for nine hours straight, which I was guilty of doing that with mine. So I I get it. Um, It's easy to say this is a defiant child. How about spend the time talking about the need to have God as our God and his word as our guide? Let the Holy Spirit do what only the Holy Spirit can do. And maybe, just maybe, we'll have a situation where if it was defiance and rebellion, it's handled God's way as opposed to the parent forcing the child. Because you have to even ask yourself the question, why is this so important? Why must you have your two-year-old potty trained? Well, because this is going to happen in the future and we're going to go on this trip in two months. You're putting something much beyond what God calls as mandatory. So apply the word of God to that situation and then add 10 or 15 years. And now you're talking about driving and you're talking about where somebody will work or where they'll go to school. Mm -hmm. And you'll have the basis by which your child knows that you go to God's law to say, is what I'm enforcing godly or is it just my own preference? Very good. Okay. I can remember with both my daughters, each a little bit differently. I was struggling with this potty training thing and this potty training thing. I don't even know. Was I embarrassed because other people had their children potty trained or not? Well, I remember with my oldest, I said to the pediatrician, I really do think she's got the ability to go to the bathroom. And I think there might be some defiance going on. So he said, fine, let me handle it. So he was a doctor from Switzerland and he had this beautiful Swiss accent. And he looked at her and he said, from now on, no more going in your diaper. And she never, he he just said it with authority. She liked him. 
She never had a mistake <laughs> after that. Right. My younger That's daughter, this, this story is funny. This story is funny. Okay. Go ahead. We went to a um, car show because my husband's in the car business and there was this big robot named Vorion. And Vorion had a message for kids not to do drugs. That's why Vorion was there. Kids, stay in school, don't do drugs. So my three-year-old daughter was with us. When we came back, her older brother said, tell me about what happened. And she said, oh, there was Vorion. And he said, don't pee in your diaper. That's what she heard. <laughs> <laughs> Vorian never said that, but she was obviously being somewhat of a defiant child in this. And so what convicted her was something she didn't even actually hear. And then she never had problems after that. So it has to be conviction that comes from someplace. If we want our children to change, let's just make sure we're not enforcing on them our views that are inconsistent with God's views. Right. And the only way that we're going to know that is if we know if we will look to God's law and begin there for making our own judgments. Otherwise, we won't know. We won't know if it's God or Vorion who's telling us to do something. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, and and that, if it matters. Right. And, and, let, and it does matter, obviously, because that was once you grow up and you realize that was a mechanical robot that somebody was operating with a microphone. That's not who God is. So right. the, the point I'm trying to make is why parents and since my focus is on moms and moms who are educating their children, if you don't know how to apply God's law, first of all, you have to know it, but how to apply it in specific situations don't expect your children to conform to you. Make sure they're conforming to God. Otherwise, are you making yourself a God to your children? Right. What we can't do is get mommy or daddy mad. Oh, then they must be God, as opposed to what we can't do is get God mad. Mm -hmm. Right. So if we think about the sovereign, who do we obey as the, as the highest authority that's not mom and dad necessarily. It's not the teacher at school necessarily. It's not Vorion. It's God. So we have to know what he says and start start there so that we can identify so that we can properly position ourselves in terms of the um, that proper authority structure to represent them well when we're instructing our children. Right. The Westminster Catechism defines sin is a transgression of the law of God. And we can transgress by one of two ways. We can do what we're not supposed to do, or we can fail to do what we're supposed to do. So mm -hmm. really early on in the education of your children, and I'm saying this applies to parents who are homeschooling. These applies to parents who have their kids in Christian schools or public schools. Wherever you are right now, you better have a clear picture of what sin is and what it's not. And once you do, and then you apply corrective means, my guess is along the way, you're going to ask yourself the question, is where I have my child placed helping them sin more or mm -hmm. helping them sin less? And that's where the decision usually comes to pull children out of public education because public education is not going to declare Jesus is Lord because they don't believe those who run it do not believe that Jesus is Lord. So why would you have them there? Right. They may have a nice um, Christian school teacher, but the, the structure, the structure itself in the, the um, authority there it is not the Lord. And the seduction isn't just the nice teacher. It's the science lab. It's the, we have a 3D printer or we have a symphony or we have master classes from people who are Juilliard graduates. In other words, whatever the enticement is, then you have parents responding to what's important. 
And if this is what's important, in other words, if you're willing to sacrifice your children, knowing God's word and applying it throughout every area of their lives and their thinking, then you have a God other than the living God is who you're account who you're accountable to and who you're answering to. Mm -hmm. Next week, we'll get into idols, which is similar to violation of the first commandment, but it takes on sometimes very um, different manifestations. So although they're related and both violations of the first and second commandment go against the first great commandment, it bears with, um, you know, investigation to see, do we have idols that we don't know exist in our lives? Right, right. Well, I know that the things that we're talking about um, over the next 10 weeks today and over the next 10 weeks are very, may be very challenging for people. And so I want them to know that uh, we will be praying for them and that the Lord is God and he is very gracious that if we will turn from our sin and, and, uh, and seek him, that, that he'll meet us there. He gives us the Holy Spirit to guide us into these truths. So if what we talk about, if it pricks their heart, don't just brush it off. Take that to the Lord and ask him if your thinking is contrary to his word. And if your behavior is contrary to his, um, the ways that he would have us to, to go and um, let us do be the people that God's called us to be. And let me say this, if your heart's breaking over what you hear, join the club. That's how most of us came to this understanding. We realized that we were doing things that were contrary to what God wanted us to do. And feel free to reach out, ask questions. Um, it's not like we haven't been there. The reason we can both speak with some authority is that we're both pretty experienced on how not to do it the right way. Exactly. And none of us are born again with perfect theology. You know, we have to look to his word and we have to let him, him direct us. So if we will do that, he will, he is faithful. All right. Well, thank you everybody for listening. And uh, Nancy, I'll catch you next week. Next week, friend. Thanks. Bye-bye.